So I don't know what stage your business is really at, um, whether you're at the, I've got this fantastic idea and I'm annoying my partner stage, whether you're the, um, you've actually started your startup and you're at the holy shit stage, um, or whether you're at the stage where you really want to grow very fast, um, or you could be at the CBA stage and you're taking revenue the size of New Zealand um, type stage. Um, what I want to do is <laughs> take you through the Air Tasker journey actually how we started um, and some of the things we've, we've learned along the way as we've started to actually get traction in the business. So hopefully you've seen some of those ads. We did our, did our first above the line advertising campaign uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's, so far it seemed to have worked. So Airtasker is an online marketplace for doing small jobs. Um, and what we've seen in the, as classifieds have started to digitize, um, things like real estate, car sales, Seek have done really well. Um, and our founders saw an opportunity that we say, well, if Seek, where you're getting a new job every um, two or three years, can make $4.2 billion, if you're doing small jobs, you might, um, hopefully, you do uh, more than that uh, every two or three years. Um, and then what's come along is the sharing economy. And these have suddenly changed everything, and they've grown incredibly rapidly. Now, one of the things I think is, isn't talked about is why I think they've done really, really well. Is because where the sharing economy is, they're invested in the end state. So you don't want a cleaner, you want your house cleaned. We only get paid when you actually find that person you like, they turn up, they actually do the job, and you both agree that work is done. So there's a lot of steps along the way for that to actually get to go wrong but when we only get paid when it goes wrong. So if you take a normal classified, like a high pages, what you do is you put in there, you get your three quotes, and they have no idea whether those three quotes are any good. That mean they've already got their money. But because you're invested all the way through, um, then I think hopefully that's going to be good. Uh, you're more aligned with what the customer actually wants. So how well have we actually gone? We're still a startup, but we're doing OK. So um, we have, we're Australian only. We have 850,000 people on the platform. And we're doing about 45,000 jobs a month. Um, and I love this chart. This is the genuine chart from the board papers. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to show it or not, so I didn't ask the CEO. Um, <laughs> but if you're going to draw a chart, you would draw a chart like that. It's really bloody awesome. It's lame ass clip art good. <laughs> But if you're in your startup phase, it's all good to see the end picture. Now it looks like we're actually getting traction. But if you're there for the first two years, this is what it actually looks like. And our co-founders talk about it, saying that they wouldn't wish it on their worst enemy. You know, there's some months you go, oh, finally getting it, and only for the next month for it all to fall away. You've got to live this day in, day out. So one of the first things they've all talked about is always have a co-founder, someone you can lean against. And this is because it's really hard. So the way marketplaces work is they're a two-sided marketplace, and they only actually got value um, when there's actually people using it. So it's a bit like a nightclub. I mean, you can have the greatest nightclub out there, but if no one's dancing in it, it's just lame. So how do you get people to dance? First of all, you need the club. You need to get you know, the DJs, the booze. You need to get you know, it all going on. You need the hype. You need some people to know about this is actually happening. And then you need to get the people. You need to get the right mix of people you're actually looking for in that club. So whether you need boys and girls, you generally need more girls, or if you need boys and boys, whatever you want it to do, you need to get the right mix of people. So bring them to the air tasker analogy. So the club is the product. So you need to get the UX right, the, the, the product right. We need to get the payments and things like that right. Marketing um, is the buzz, so you need to get the buzz, the PR, and things like that. And then you need to get the right mix of users. So for us, you need to get the right mix of um, posters and workers. If you are looking at a marketplace, you generally want to get the worker, the poster side, because a cleaner, for example, can um, do 20 cleans a week, but you need 20 people to actually collect tw uh, cleaning jobs. So we focus a lot around the posters. So we have three core uh, columns where we actually work towards. So we work towards liquidity, 
uh, matching um, and trust in our marketplace. And they're the, the core things. So liquidity is definitely the hardest thing to get off the ground. It took us, what, nearly three years to do it. Um, that's because you've got a bit of a chicken egg problem. You've got to have people posting tasks to get workers. You need workers posting tasks. So how do you actually start building that momentum? So the first start is, you know, you've got the basic stuff. So you need to get your SEO um, correct. Um, we also seem to send an awful lot of money to Ireland through Google um, for SEM. Um, she's left, isn't she? I can say whatever I like. Um, and obviously, we do a lot of work around optimization to try and get that, that changed. Then we try and build these growth hacks we talked about before. Um, so there's growth hacks around just doing really uh, a lot of optimization, but there's also we do little events and things like that. So one example is around the iPhone launches. So Australia is the first people around the world, um, now New Zealand got banned, um, to actually get the iPhones. So we, uh, in the early stages, we hired this guy. He just um, got made redundant. He was a truck driver. And we hired him to stand in the queue, to be the front of the queue to get the first ever iPhone. Now, what we wanted to do is we thought, you know, he, would, he went there two days before, and we thought he would be with a bunch of other people. He was there by himself for 24 hours. <laughs> But he turned out to be fantastic to the media. He loved it. He was really good to the media. Apart from he kept forgetting to talk about Airtasker. So apart from the T-shirt, <laughs> here he is. Oh, oh good. Um, but he turned out to be great. And we actually started to um, get lots of um, spikes in, back into our site from doing all these type of events. We do all sorts of things like that um, with, uh, if there's a launch. We've also now, just as a byproduct, we now capitalized the high, whole iPhone queuing market. So if you want your iPhone 8 coming out next year, then put it on Airtasker. It's about 50 bucks for a queue. So then also we do a lot around PR. PR is really important for us. It really works as a medium. Um, we notice that when we get a newspaper article to us and it links back, you always got to fight for those links, um, that 14% of those people then sign up um, into, into the Airtasker world. So it's, for me, that's really high. And what we find is quite interesting from all the PR efforts is our dual strategy of web and app. That what we see people do is they go to the web, they check out the how it works, the how to earn money pages, and then they actually download the app, which, is, which works really well. Actually, interesting, if you're talking to the US market, what we found, we were on BuzzFeed a little while um, last weekend, and uh, Americans work differently. Um, so Australians seem very conservative. They want to know what's going on. The first thing the US do is they download the app, then they realize that it's only for Australia and then give you a one-star review. <laughs> Americans. Um, <laughs> so once we've actually got, the, got them, then we actually try to uh, try and keep them. So we do a lot of work around EDM work, social works, and things like that. <laughs> so, um, so matching, so it's all great having liquidity, lots of tasks in our, in our platform. But if no one can find each other, then there's no point. So what we do is we spend a lot of work around actually trying to get the discoverability of our platform right. And we do things like task alerts. So if you put a task up, um, our workers subscribe to a, the keywords via the, a, a radius, and we send them an email. We do a lot of around search, and we do a lot around user testing to try and get them uh, together. And how we put that together is we look at bids. Uh, per task. So as you can see, we're gradually uh, rising that up. And then trust. So tr trust is really important to our, um, to our business. Uh, for me, trust is born out of transparency, and transparency is one of our core values for the business. Um, and what we, for us, it's an interesting um, play in that we find that the defensible position, because other people can put up a task um, posting site. But if we've got more reviews, we know more about people's reputation than anyone else, then we can defend that, that position. So what we actually find is 90% of the people who uh, actually do a task actually put a review in there, which is, um, which is very high. But the other interesting thing what happens is now we've exposed that information the, the marketplace is starting to becoming self-governing. So when our people post a task that breaks our marketplace rules, 
then the workers um, actually um, they they uh, flag those those as um, incorrect, and actually they come off the website really quickly. But also, what's interesting is around the governing of what we didn't want to do as our task volume grow, we didn't also want to have customer service to grow with it. So by exposing the data, um, the, what we found was right now, maybe you've only got two or three cleaners in your suburb. What happens when you've got 20? If you show all these reviews and these completion rates, whether they actually turn up or not, um, then you are going to turn up. You are going to do that little bit extra to make sure you get a one-star review. Otherwise, you won't get the work. And similarly, just, we have a, the same rating system as uh, Airbnb that we also rate the posters. Now, if they're idiots to deal with, the cleaner's going, you know what, I've got so much liquidity, I've got so much in my marketplace, then I'll actually, I don't have to deal with the idiots anymore. So suddenly people actually have to be um, well-behaved when they post as well. And that's where the marketplace really works very well. Everyone is self-governing. So now we're getting to the point where we've got um, some liquidity. We, we're, we're starting doing OK. You know, we're not there yet. We're certainly not claiming success. We're not CBA. Um, but we're doing, doing OK. And now we've actually got to reevaluate how actually we look at things. So the first thing we do is we look at, um, are we actually abusing the power that we now have in the marketplace? So marketplace is a bit like things like even like Twitter. They are much bigger than the company that actually controls them. So um, these are people's lives that are actually in these marketplaces. So we make sure that what we're trying to do is we don't try to abuse the power to influence it just for our own personal gain. We do like to gain a little bit. Um, the other bit is around value. So we try and look at the whole mar the uh, shopper journey and see, are we adding value to, the, um, to those, those posters and workers, or are we actually getting in the way of actually creating that value? And we look at things like that. And the other thing is we now look at those assumptions that we made maybe a year ago because we were rapidly growing. Are those assumptions still valid? And I think that's where a lot of companies start to fall over is they've made an, an assumption a year ago and they haven't actually looked back at that and see if it's still valid. So one of the examples um, around that is around the task alerts. So um, I said before that you create a task and we send, you send the workers an email. We now send uh, 22 million task alert emails a month. Um, during the day, we're actually sending 250 emails a second, every second. If you are a lucky person, you put a keyword in that's very popular in, a, in something like Sydney, you'll get 440 emails uh, a day from us, which is clearly means that the, the, that feature no longer works. We need to re-challenge our assumptions. And this is where you need to be careful around the vanity metrics. Because I can go to our CEO and talk about, we're doing 22 million uh, task alert emails, and email going, you're doing a great job. But if you actually start measuring the interactions of it, you go, oh, well, actually, that means only 20,000 people are actually clicking on that and coming through to the site. Clearly, that's not working. So what I also encourage you, when you look at the interactions, don't look at the metric. Look at the ratios. Because even for us, we were talking about the product manager goes, there's 20,000 people coming to the site from these things. Don't turn it off. Saying, But 0.79% of people are actually clicking on it. And that's where you need to, uh, that's the real number to look at. Um, and this is where a lot of the big companies sort of um, fall over from it. Woolworths were fantastic at it. Um, so before I worked at Airtasker, I worked at Dick Smith. I was the CIO there. Um, that didn't work out too well. Um, and they were addicted, <laughs> ad absolutely addicted to the whole um, vanity metrics. Look at the big number. They didn't look at the interactions. Um, so just do a motto to yourself, be better than Dick Smith. <laughs> the other thing we're starting to find is we're only 50 people. And I've seen some of the names, tags from there. You guys are in really large organizations. Um, even for 50 people, uh, companies, things are starting to slow up. Lots of people have lots of ideas, lots of people competing, and things are starting to creak a little. Now, um, we really liked this concept of um, Spotify's which squads. Um, so they didn't necessarily come up with this concept. I mean, I was at Westfield, um, and we used to call them cells, named after prison, prison cells, which gives you a good idea of the culture there. Um, <laughs> but the general idea behind squads is you, you've got a tribe. 
So the tribe, um, you're a big group of those, and then you've got um, squads. So squads are cross-functional teams made up of things like product owners, developers, testers, subject matter experts. Then you've got chapters, so chapters uh, across the board, so they could be some like front-end developers. Um, and then you have guilds, which are subject matter, um, people interested in a certain subject, could be some like search. Now, with 50 people, we're not big enough to do a squad. But we liked the, they liked the concept, and it didn't mean we didn't have to start going on that journey. So we've created what we call feature squads. So if squads are too far for you, maybe feature squads might be a way to look at. So a feature squad for us is a cross-functional team to break down a particular feature. And what we do is we, first of all, these feature squads, we set out a goal, which has been mentioned before. And we use the lean startup concept around actionable. Is it possible to actually action this thing? Accessible. Um, can we actually deliver on this goal? So many goals are really lofty. Um, let's just choose something you can actually choose within the next three months and get it actually done. And is it, is it auditable? Can you actually check to see whether it's done? And then we work on these features. We start to break those down. And we use a lot around data. So data becomes prevalent for us. So we use um, quantitative stuff. So we use um, some laggard and leading measures to try and work that out. And then we do lots of quantitative stuff. So we actually, it's amazing, we talk to our users and actually ask them what they want. Um, and then, uh, then we go through de design and development. The whole outcome of those features is we're trying to actually get um, estimatable stories that we can put directly into engineering straight away. And the other thing we're starting to find, which we we're, we're find difficult, is mapping the shopper journey. Now, what happens in organization is the product gets really complicated. And so what you do is in your features, you try to break down just that small little section. Because you know everything's too big and complicated and you've only got an hour to sort it out, so you need some sort of output. So what actually happens then is you start getting this fragmented shopper journey. So what I recommend is go through those, um, uh, Go through the actual journey and actually look at all the different touch points you have with the customer. Again, look at where you're actually adding value. And the other thing is walk that journey. Do it yourself. Do it regularly. So all of the Airtasker, anyone who works at Airtasker gets credits. And what you have to do is you actually need to post a task up there uh, on a quarterly basis. And we write down the feedback to understand where we've actually broken the, the value chain. Uh, and similarly, we actually make our people be workers as well. They have to do lots of tasks. Um, so again, to see actually how it actually feels. So if you haven't done that in your product for a while, you should definitely do it. You learn much more than that uh, than you probably even would with the data. Right, tools. <laughs> I'm always interested to know what um, everyone else is using for tools, so I thought I'd just share some of ours. Um, so we do a lot of uh, AdWords and things like that. We use Sprout Social for our PR, so that helps us do all, uh, bring all those different PR messages. Been really responsive to those trolls. It's fantastic. It's really important. Um, we funnel an awful lot of things into Segment. Um, so all the different events we have in Airtasker, we throw into Segment, and then that does all the integration to all the different marketing tools. Um, because what I found out uh, is that marketing people, and there's a few of you out there, you love tools. There's always a brand new tool that will bring that one feature that will give you all the insight you're going to possibly need. So instead of always waiting for the engineering resource, we throw into segment and let that do the integration for us. Uh, yes, we use GA a lot. Um, we use Looker for our BI, which I dislike, um, but I'm the only one. Um, and we do some machine learning with uh, things like Prediction IO. For the product and engineering, um, we use um, AHA. We think that's really, I really like the way that breaks down from strategy to features down to epics. And then our, our handshake with the engineering team is uh, at the epic level, and we talk down to JIRA, which I'm sure half of you are using anyway. And of course, because I'm at Google um, and they're paying, paying for drinks, um, Google Docs, also really great for collaboration tools. Um, Dropbox Paper, if anyone's used that, it's really good too. Uh, So takeaways, um, these are my four takeaways. So first, first thing, map out the shopper journey. I know it's a bit of a cliche for some of you, you've already done it. Others, if you haven't done it for a while, re-look at it. But then don't just map it out, 
walk it, walk the actual journey, um, buy that product yourself. Liquidity, matching, and trust, that's a very marketplace-y sort of concept. Um, so if you're a more traditional pipeline-type business, um, liquidity is scale, so you're great at it, thanks CBA. Um, matching is um, around getting your products and your customers to, to match. But trust is an interesting one. How often, you know, trust in the marketplace, we talk about that every single day. But do you in your organization or do you just hide behind the whole brand if people trust the brand? But are you actively always working on, on trust? And for me, trust is transparency. Are you as transparent to the customers you possibly can? Um, watch out for the vanity metrics. Don't look at the big shiny number. It's all great. Um, remember, be better than Dick Smith. Um, measure the interactions and don't look at the metric of the interactions. Don't look at that number. Look at the ratios of those. That's the important bit. And the other bit, we talked a lot about data and tools and things like that today, is don't forget to actually talk to your customers. Bring them in, have a discussion with them. Don't hide behind the data. It's far too easy to be able to do that. Talking with your customers, you'll learn much more about insight about than, than what is just going through your dashboards. The, at the moment, a lot of it is it's a complete free market. So what's probably different than uh, like a task rabbit overseas is they do um, mandate different things. Um, we leave it completely up there and open. So you can upload your licenses and things like that. It's clearly the next stage. We do things like police badge. So we do police checks. So we have that and you can have a badge. But those badges are start to going to get more and more prevalent. Um, there are uh, other banks we are talking to um, to actually even have identification just through that bank. Um, uh, and yeah, so we, uh, and I think licenses and all those sort of things become, will become more and then we're trying to build more credibility in there. But I can't, I can't stress enough that what, what you traditionally would expect to be a race to the bottom on the bids, people post a task and people would go race to the bottom a bit of a freelancer style. Um, doesn't really happen in our platform. What you find is the people who are getting the jobs are the ones who have the best reputation and actually have the best profiles. So they show a lot of demonstration of the work they've actually done.